Good afternoon and welcome to the APPG on Sustainable Finances uh, event on carbon pricing as uh, brought to you by Zero C, the campaign for uh, carbon tax. It's really great to see all of you here today and um, I'm particularly pleased that we've got such a strong panel of people to talk to about this event, uh, about this issue. Uh, we know that of course it's becoming increasingly pressing that, we're, that a decision is made on how we might introduce some kind of carbon price um, since, of course, our exit from the EU and therefore, by extension, the EU emissions trading scheme provides an opportunity to review carbon pricing policy and see how it might be more made more effective in driving progress towards net zero and ensuring that the cost of decarbonisation is spread more fairly across society. Now, of course, there is a need for U the UK to demonstrate domestic leadership um, generally on climate change um, for a successful COP at the end of the year in Glasgow and that that role might include a more ambitious carbon pricing agenda um, uh, may well uh, deliver some of the, the ambition that uh, the UK government is looking for. Of course, the recent announcement that the, go the government is considering introducing a carbon tax in certain sectors is important for this conversation. And we are starting to see a building up of public appetite for green tax reform. I think it's of no, it's no great, um, it's, it's of some significance that uh, Rishi Sunak seems to be presenting some of his budgetary uh, measures for tax raising uh, as, as something that would, um, uh, be seen as green. Now, of course, in that budget, there is an opportunity to leverage this momentum towards policy change and taking action to support consumers to make the lifestyle changes that will be required as part of the UK shift to net zero. So this is a really important moment for us to be dis discussing carbon pricing and how that might work. So first of all, we'll be hearing from Hannah Dillon, who is uh, uh, who will introduce the zero carbon campaign. We'll then speak. We'll then hear from Darren Jones, the chair of the of uh, the Bay Select Committee, uh, Ria Marie Thomas from the Green Finance Institute, and uh, finally uh, Jerome Mayhew, uh, MP, who will be closing uh, the the discussion, um, talking about carbon uh, carbon border tariffs, because of course. Um, this will be as much to do with how we trade internationally as how we trade within the country. Then, of course, there'll be some uh, an opportunity for some questions. But do, of course, remember that the chat is available for you to be able to post so, um, suggestions um, and observations. But if if you would put your questions to the panel in the Q&A, that would be marvellous. Um, Hannah, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Polly, and thanks to everyone who's joining us today. Uh, as Polly said, I'm head of the Zero Carbon Campaign, and we advocate for the role that stronger, fairer and more consistent carbon pricing can play in facilitating the UK's transition towards net zero. Um, I'm going to give a quick overview of how the UK carbon pricing landscape has evolved over the past year or so, um, for those who might be less familiar with it. And then I'm going to share a few insights um, tapping into what Polly said about how we believe the public are positioned to respond to increased pricing ambition and what policy measures might be needed to maintain that support. So last July, I had the opportunity to pitch to the Bay Select Committee about what topics we felt their future inquiry should focus on. And perhaps unsurprisingly, we chose to talk about the need for an inquiry on the future of UK carbon pricing. And the committee accepted this proposal. I think Darren's going to talk a bit to that shortly, but I thought I should revisit five of the key areas for reform that we raised back then and do a bit of a sense check on what's progressed since to help set the context for today's discussion. So appropriately given the topic, the concerns we raised can be grouped as the five C's, which were cost, coverage, compatibility, consumer impacts and competitiveness. Um, but I will leave this last point out because I think Jerome's going to talk to that a bit shortly too. Um, it's worth quickly noting at this point, for those who don't know, that the UK has recently rolled out our own emissions pricing system called the UK ETS, and this replaces the one that we had pre-Brexit, and it's essentially a cap and trade system where those involved buy a volume of credits or permits equivalent to their emissions output, um, and then the total volume of permits on that market, which is known as the cap, decreases over time. And um, we say, I say that we've rolled it out. The first auctions for the ETS will actually be held this May. Um, and the UK ETS currently covers emissions from heavy industry and power. Uh, and on top of this, we have a carbon tax on electricity generation called the carbon, tax, uh, carbon price support, sorry. So back to the five Cs. The first one, emissions coverage. So we challenged the percentage of UK greenhouse gas emissions that actually have a carbon price attached to them. Um, last summer, it was about one third, and that hasn't changed with the introduction of the UK ETS yet. However, 
um, there has been a commitment to both extending the ETS across more sectors of the UK economy um, and also to a review of the approach towards free allocation of permits within the ETS. Um, and this move is really welcome, especially the review of free allocation, which is something that we've been calling for. Although we would caution how easy it is to for sort of small businesses and consumers to respond to an emissions trading system and therefore whether a carbon tax might be more appropriate for certain sectors. Uh, the second C was the cost of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions. So we didn't believe that the cost was actually high enough to drive the levels of decarbonisation required to achieve net zero. Um, but again, some good news here. So the UK ETS will have an auction reserve price of price, sorry, of £22 per tonne, which is more than the £15 originally touted. And again, this ambition is really welcome. Uh, the price is not necessarily as high as we might have wanted, but we recognise the benefits of increasing pricing ambition over time. The third C was compatibility, and that was kind of how our carbon pricing system compares to our net zero target. Um, and the UK ETS has been presented as the world's first net zero aligned cap and trade system. But currently, this is only really in name rather than in practice. Um, we have actually reduced the ETS cap. So as I mentioned, the volume of emissions allowed on the market by 5% compared to the share we had of the EU market. But that cap is still actually higher than the volume of emissions produced by those involved in the market, which suggests at this point it's not quite strong enough. Um, but again, some good news here. There's been a commitment to aligning the annual emissions caps of the UK ETS with the sixth carbon budget and therefore with net zero, which is really good news. And finally, just coming on to consumer impacts. Um, I make this point last, but actually it's one of the most important things we need to think about when talking about carbon pricing reform and actually talking about net zero more generally. Carbon pricing can be regressive. And if we're going to increase our ambition on it, we need to find ways to protect consumers from bearing the brunt of those costs. And we've done a lot of thinking about this from a campaign perspective, um, and I'm happy to revisit some of the specifics in the discussion later if there are questions on it. Um, but I just want to really quickly look at the look at the landscape moving forward and the challenges ahead. So um, from this whistle stop tour, hopefully you can tell that there is some good momentum here. Um, and we know, as Polly mentioned, that there are senior government officials taking ours and others calls for carbon pricing reform seriously, which is great. But we'd still caution this is this should really be seen as the start rather than the end of carbon pricing reform. Um, there are some really big challenges ahead including how to account for the lack of carbon costs on gas used in home heating, what to do with agriculture and emissions from waste incineration, how we manage competitiveness through all of this, um, not to mention pricing domestic and international transport, and also what we can do to effectively price and support investment in negative emissions. Um, but just really quickly, it's worth saying that we're not gonna get anywhere on this without support and a mandate from people. So I thought I'd quickly summarise some recent polling that we've conducted. We've done two big lots of polling this February on this topic. And actually it does appear that there is a public mandate building for action on carbon pricing. So we found an acceptance that taxes will have to rise to fill the COVID deficit. Um, a belief that any of these rises should be directed at those who in the eyes of the public at least deserve to pay. Um, seven out of 10 people support a carbon tax on producers of greenhouse gas emissions. And this is partly because they think it can be an effective tool for reducing these emissions, but also because um, they view this as being a fair way of addressing the COVID deficit. But ultimately, people do recognise that however hard we try to mitigate it, increased ambition on carbon pricing might have cost implications for them. And as such, the majority want to ensure any carbon pricing increase or reform is introduced alongside policies that firstly protect the poorest and most vulnerable households from bearing the costs, but secondly, provide access to alternative technologies. And we found in polling that this manifests as support for investment of revenues and things like energy efficiency upgrades, um, as well as green job creation and reskilling. Um, it's quite a lot of information in a short time, so sorry about that, but um, clearly this is a meaty topic. There are some exciting opportunities ahead. I've mentioned it appears that there is a growing public and political appetite for action, provided that we get this right, alongside a backdrop of increased ambition abroad. So, um, yeah, we're really looking forward to this discussion and seeing what happens in this space. Thanks, Polly.
Thank you very much, Hannah. And I think what's interesting is that quite a lot of people talk about how carbon pricing will be a simple me mechanism in order to be able to send a strong signal to the market. And then once you actually get into the detail of it, nothing is quite as simple as uh, as some people think. So it would be good to hear now from uh, Darren Jones, MP, who is the chair of the Bay Select Committee. And uh, the, the Select Committee has had an inquiry into the implications for strengthening and extending carbon pricing. Um, so it would be good to hear from him about what those the, what the conclusions so far have been uh, from the committee and what other things he thinks if we are going to go down the the uh, the um, uh, path of more carbon pricing, what needs to be considered? Darren. Well, Polly, thank you. Uh, it's great to be with you again and to see everybody um, on the screen who uh, I've seen as I've been learning about carbon pricing and emission trade trading schemes over the past year or so since I've been chair of the committee again. Um, uh, as Polly and Hannah both mentioned, we, um, we've we been looking at this issue on the select committee, um, not least because Hannah pitched a very excellent pitch in our um, friendlier version of Dragon's Den called the My Bays uh, Inquiry, uh, but also because we have a parliamentary responsibility um, to provide um, uh, oversight of the government's what's called a common framework, so the kind of post-Brexit rules for how the nations in the United Kingdom work together on the emissions trading scheme. So we've had some um, evidence on um, the post-Brexit ETS um, and also um, questions to uh, Quasi, who was then obviously the energy minister and is now the secretary of state. Um, unfortunately, we've still not had the full common framework presented to us, even though it has been announced in the newspapers that the emissions trading scheme is gearing up and ready to go. So um, we expect some more information on that soon. Uh, and there'll be further hearings on my committee when we get that to understand how that's going to um, work in the in the UK. Um, and then there's this broader interest, which is how does carbon pricing um, uh, work between the idea of you know the, the, the carbon tax that the Treasury is looking at and the emissions trading scheme? Uh, how do those timescales align over each other? Um, and also, how does how does the UK's position flit, fit internationally uh, within this um, debate? And that's a really interesting topic in the year of COP26. And I hope that if we do take bold domestic decisions um, in order to announce them in the relevance of COP26, that we then also take the opportunity of presiding over COP to ensure that we have those conversations with other countries as well. One of the benefits, uh, as I understand it, of of the emissions trading scheme is that a bit like a global puzzle, you can kind of fit together uh, with emissions trading schemes in other countries and jurisdictions around the world. The government hasn't really given a clear answer yet as to whether it intends for the UK ETS to formally link with the EU ETS. And there's various detailed discussions going on in the background about how that might work if it does work and when it might work. Um, but there was also encouraging evidence that we received about other countries and indeed states in the United States um, looking at emissions trading scheme models where you might be able to to collaborate globally in a way that works for many of the businesses um, that work in a global um, framework. So the uh, how we build on the ETS, well, first of all, how we set it up and get it functioning, um, then how we build on it, and then how we take, take any decisions around other types of carbon pricing um, is really a very deep and complex issue. Um, I, I think it's fundamental um, to our climate ambitions, and I think it's fundamental that we have this conversation at COP26, but we also need to um, ensure that ministers do this in the right way. Um, and there are a couple of um, uh, kind of stakeholders who understandably are nervous about some of these things. Um, consumers and first and foremost to, to, our, to our concern as a committee um, and ensuring um, uh, to use Westminster phraseology, the just transition actually means something for consumers. If you suddenly ramp up the cost of their gas bills when it's not ready to convert to another boiler or another form of heating, um, you're going to annoy a lot of people. Um, and changing their boilers is already going to annoy a lot of people, but we've got to do it. Uh, and so you don't want to make that worse uh, by taking decisions uh, in, in a kind of a, a less considered way and in a way which can bring people with you. Um, and it's really important that we get that right. On the industry side as well, um, you know, some a, a lot of the players in, in the current EU ETS are very fond of the ETS. They make a good representation about how it drives investment and decarbonisation, especially for some of the big kind of um, capital intensive industries. They're concerned about how we transition away from credits that they were able to use um, in the European scheme and what that means in the UK scheme. And as we extend it out to more sectors, which I think is the right thing to do, uh, we need to think about how we make that transition as easy as possible whilst also meeting our overriding climate objectives. So a discussion around credits and transition requirements through that for industry is going to be really important, not least because it will also affect jobs um, in certain sectors, especially carbon intensive sectors, if you don't do this right. So as a select committee, 
party chairman and a politician, um, uh, I have kind of angry consumers and angry workers um, on my mind. And I don't think we have to get there. I don't think that's the outcome, but it's the risk um, if we don't get it right. And it's important, therefore, um, that we have a really open and transparent and consultative process in this um, and not just kind of announce something because we want to announce something mere COP, uh, which basically scares everybody and risks kind of setting us um, back. Uh, the last thing I would just mention is, um, and I think Hannah briefly mentioned it there, um, you know, structure the schemes, get all of this working, excellent. Um, how do you then deal with pricing? Um, is it down to a treasury minister or a chancellor who might become unpopular at a budget for increasing carbon pricing? Is there an independent process that sets this? Is there a global forum in which we need to have these conversations? And how do we ensure that it actually meets our, our net zero commitments uh, alongside um, um, providing transparency and independence of the pricing point uh, so that it's not just there as a kind of symbolic gesture, um, but something that really has has um, uh, an impact. And of course, uh, just to finish, um, uh, these things don't stand alone. Um, they are multifaceted and will have direct and indirect implications in lots of other different policy spaces. And I know Jerome is going to be speaking later on carbon pricing border adjustments, sorry, border adjustments for carbon, which I know is really important, especially for some of our intensive industries in the UK. Um, and both on the Environmental Audit, Audit Committee, on my committee and other places, there's a shared interest to try to understand how all of the pieces of this puzzle fit together domestically as well as internationally. So a huge amount of work to do do, um, but we know it's on the government's agenda. Um, we know there's potentially some interesting policy announcements coming up, uh, and I'm therefore grateful to all of you for doing all the hard work um, and explaining how we can make this right um, for people and for industry um, in the months to come. Thanks, Polly. Thank you, Darren. That's really helpful. And it's important to have that kind of the, the sort of reality check of the political context, both the, uh, the appetite that there is to do something, the risks about doing something fast without thinking about the implicate the, the long term implications, but also, of course, the necessity of politics meeting the science, which is extremely pressing and challenging. Uh, Remory Thomas, the Chief Executive of the Green Finance Institute, I'd like to bring you in at this point, Ryan Marie, because it'll be really interesting to hear from you um, what you think the relationship would be uh, of carbon pricing to finance, since we you're interested in greening the finance for the financial system. And we know that, that ostensibly there's loads of sustainable finance there ready to uh, invest in uh, projects should they be there. Is carbon pricing one of the ways of solving that particular challenge? Marie. Thanks ever so much, Polly. Um, as you mentioned, I'm not a politician and neither am I an economist. Um, I've spent 20 years as a banker. So my perspective here is the relationship of carbon pricing to the capital markets, specifically the challenge, not only of greening finance, but of financing green, redirecting the trillions of pounds needed to fund the transition to net zero away from the petro economy and towards the electro economy and how the carbon price might play a role in that. So fundamentally, as we know, the key issue with how the capital markets are currently operating when it comes to supporting the transition is that the cost of capital for companies is not sufficiently influenced by how sustainable the company is. Ideally, in capital markets that functioned for the long term, sustainable companies should attract higher valuations. And that would in turn lead to an ability to raise capital more cheaply and confer a competitive advantage. But we have ample evidence that the invisible hand of the market does not currently have any green fingers. And so for that, so for reasons of both market inefficiency and market failure, we're, we're seeing this, we're seeing this problem. So with regards to market inefficiency, there are a number of practical reasons why markets aren't recognizing or rewarding sustainable behavior at the pace and the scale we need. There's a lack of comparable decision useful data on environmental, social and governance considerations. There's also a lack of expertise in financial services um, and a lack of knowledge amongst those tasked with interpreting that data, which we're obviously trying to address. But possibly the overriding issue is short termism with capital markets currently structured to evaluate companies based on near term criteria, maximizing short term returns at the expense of longer term investment. And there's clearly a whole discussion to be had on that. But the focus today is more on the market failure um, situation and the relative roles of policymakers and investors in addressing that. So with regards, um, so the difference between capital markets inefficiency and capital markets failure is that the former reflects a failure of the predictive powers of investors, whereas the latter is due to a failed market price mechanism. 
for example, as we're discussing today, the social costs that flow from capital change impacts are not reflected in the market price of carbon intensive goods and services. Or as a banker would see it, the externalities of unsustainable business practices do not hit the company's profit and loss statement at all. So the argument for carbon pricing is obviously to correct the market failure, as Polly said earlier. The markets respond to price signals and they are a function of government policy, supervisory bodies and global standard setters. Investors cannot correct market failures by ourselves. Ensuring the price mechanism works properly is the role of government and not investors. Although I do believe it is incumbent on the financial services industry to assist and advise policymakers on the most effective ways of achieving that. So having said all that, I'm keen to make uh, two key points. The first is that shifting private sector financial flows by adjusting pricing requires carbon price, carbon tax, and creating other incentives in which market forces operate too. So carbon pricing is critical to internalizing the externalities of climate change. Um, but given the international nature of change, of trade and of the, of the capital markets themselves, we can't address this purely within our borders. And obviously Jerome is gonna talk about this, but we can't wait for all governments to agree on a meaningful cost of carbon. So it might be useful to look for sectors where some element of common cross-border action on carbon price is likely and make progress that can then be tested, demonstrated and scaled to other sectors, but one to discuss. Clearly carbon markets, uh, carbon pricing alone isn't the panacea for capital markets. So as well as the standards and the regulations that need to apply to the real economy pathways, there are specific complementary policy and regulatory levers to shift market price signals, and they include capital weights. So a major factor in inst institutional investors' decision about what to invest in is based on the amount of capital they must hold against each investor investment. So if regulators set capital level levels to reflect the long-term risks of assets to financial stability, that would incentivize more investment in green assets and a transition away from high carbon. I noted there was a comment in the Q&A about the discount rate in the green book, and I'm assuming that was a, that would be, could be designed to achieve a similar effect. Um, and then finally, a point about subsidies. Governments also need to remove the damaging fossil fuel subsidies that are creating perverse incentives to fund emissions. So global fund fossil fuel subsidies in 2019 did decrease, but they still remain in excess of something like $320 billion uh, globally. And then my very, very final point, Polly, before coming back to you is um, the, one of the advantages of carbon pricing is the long-term clarity that it provides um, in underpinning scenarios for different sectors. As financiers, by setting out a carbon price and putting that into our, um, into our forward-looking revenue and cash flow models, it, it, it's providing a clear level set and it's providing a, com a comparable figure across different businesses offer operating in various industries. So I'll, I'll leave that there and, and back to you, Polly. Thank you very much, Marie. That's uh, very helpful and a very good perspective for us to uh, consider when all of, when again, uh, clarity that is not a panacea and what needs to go alongside with it for it to really work is going to be key. And I think that takes us neatly on to Jerome Mayhew, um, who's been doing a lot of thinking about the role of um, carbon border tariffs and, car and border adjustment. Jerome, do you, do you want to explain what, you, what that means for people who might not be so familiar with border adjustment and why particularly you think that's an issue when it comes to issues to do with um, having a carbon price and a carbon tax? Yeah, thanks, Polly. So a border carbon adjustment is a mechanism. It's not a good thing in its own right, but it allows us to raise carbon pricing in our domestic uh, sector uh, and become an international outlier. So we don't have to wait for the global price of carbon to all go up together. Wouldn't that be a nice thing? But it's not going to happen anytime soon. So if we raise our domestic price of carbon, essentially the cost of energy, then uh, one of the negative impacts that has is it makes our domestic manufacturers uncompetitive. And uh, without some kind of tariff system to protect them, 
or to maintain a level playing field, I should I should call it, then you uh, <laughs> then you uh, will get undercut by cheaper, higher carbon imports taking out their domestic market, and it also will make them uh, uncompetitive internationally on the export market. So a, a tariff system, what it does very basically is it assesses the level of carbon in an import and it applies the same cost to that carbon that you're applying to your domestic manufacturers. And the reason why I corrected myself about using the, the P word protectionism is it is not protectionist. What it is doing is, is applying exactly the same uh, level to treatment to uh, international competitors as, as you are to your domestic market. So that's what it's trying to do. Sounds simple in practice, fearsomely complicated. Um, but there is a growing amount of support for this uh, internationally. And we've got the European Union here uh, in July last year started a consultation as to how they could implement um, a border carbon adjustment for the whole of the, U uh, the European Union. And also Joe Biden very noticeably in his campaign literature started talking about uh, border carbon adjustment or an equivalent for the United States of America. So we've got really big trading blocks who are now actively talking about this. And also uh, in our own government, there's a lot of there's a lot of interest in the government, in the departments, although also a degree of nervousness, it's fair to say, about how a border carbon adjustment could work. And the case for it is very strong because what it does is it allows you, as I've briefly mentioned, to raise the cost of carbon um, to more accurately to reflect the true cost of exchange. Because at the moment we have carbon in any, in any transaction, we've got carbon as an externality disappearing off into the ether and the purchaser isn't paying for it. And if we can internalize that externality as a free marketeer, we're getting the market to start working on carbon. Because at the moment, our market, the free market doesn't work on carbon reduction because it cannot put a price on that part of the exchange. If through raising the price of carbon, and the Bank of England tells us that that has to be raised to $100 or $100 a tonne by 2030 to maintain a, a transition progress, then um, if we can do that, then we start moving away from the government having to tell us what to do to reach carbon net zero. And we start unleashing the immense power of the free market to find the most efficient use of resources backed up by uh, clear market signals from government and some of the regulatory uh, uh, issues that we've been talking about already to this afternoon. But I see that as the, as the biggest win is, is unleashing the free market, reducing the need for government interventions and increasing efficiency. And then you've got to ask yourself, so those, those are all the positive reasons why we should be looking very, very seriously this year at border carbon adjustments. But there's also a negative reason, which is, as I've already mentioned, there's a lot of international interest on this. And the risk is, if we don't lead on this, then we're going to be seeing the results of a border carbon adjustment with us on the outside, with uh, the, the European Union, who we've seen over the last few months is by nature rather protectionist. Uh, using, you know, there's a real risk that if we don't lead this, then there, there'll be a degree of green protectionism developing, which would be disastrous, I mean, really disastrous, I think, for our, our ability internationally to, to um, use this as a positive economic lever rather than a negative one. So, you know, it does great things for our, potentially does great things for our domestic economy, allows us to develop a domestic market of low carbon manufacturing, bringing back an industrial renaissance of manufacturing in a low carbon environment here, which then can be exported uh, using the reverse of the border carbon adjustment, uh, a rebate when you have your high carbon product, uh, sorry, your high cost, low carbon product, get, uh, exporting to a, a high carbon, <laughs> a, a high carbon, low cost economy, then you can have a rebate, a sort of a reverse process to make you um, more competitive internationally as well. Okay, so why do we want one? It allows us to reduce carbon leakage, leading to an industrial renaissance. It allows an increase of the market um, for low carbon products in the UK, so the consumer can choose. There's no, there's no incentive at the moment to choose a low carbon product when you're a consumer because you don't know which one it is and there's no, there's no price signal. If you give a price signal and there is importantly a low carbon alternative, and that comes to the fairness agenda that um, some of the other speakers have already mentioned too, then the market does its job and it's unleashed. And finally, it is a great opportunity for us to show real carb, um, carbon leadership, global leadership here. And as luck would have it, we've got the G7 presidency uh, in June and then followed shortly thereafter in November for the COP26. 
My focus is actually on the G7 because this is a complicated approach. It's going to have some losers internationally as well as winners. I think of China as being one. And uh, it's not going to be universally popular in the first instance. So rather than trying to get consensus, global consensus at the COP26, start with the G7, where six out of the seven nations who are taking part there have already expressed support in one form or another for um, the concept of border carbon adjustment. And then we can, we can show, we can lead the way rather like the, the, um, the European Union, the, the initial six developed and then grew out, grew out, then perhaps we have the opportunity to do that uh, with, uh, with border carbon adjustment, both in terms of, of the, the countries who are ready and willing to lead the way, but also in the sectors which it's covered, um, which are covered by it, whether you start with high emitting uh, sectors and then grow out as your experience and your knowledge grows or, or, or not. Back to you, Polly. Oh, it appears that Polly has frozen. Oh, are you back? I'm back. The, fun, the funny thing is, San Francisco logs on and Hackney just freezes, basically. It happens at this time of day every day. Uh, I apologise for that. Um, I wish it was, uh, I wish uh, we had better broadband right in the heart of our city, our big cities, let alone having uh, high, super fast broadband in uh, rural areas, which is equally important for the infrastructure of our country. Right, we've got plenty of questions to go and I'd like to bring some uh, some specific ones in we've got Barry Gardner um has asked a question uh, particularly but um Barry who's uh who knows a lot about this from his time when as uh, shadow secretary of state for international trade and also um uh, at uh, deck before that surely border adjustment taxes are an unfair way of incentivizing other countries particularly in a, in a global south to decarbonize is there any evidence that they are doing such because just transition is an internationalist issue UK, the uk should be increasing international climate finance contributions not just taxing imports jerome what's your thoughts on that well barry and i have had a number of discussions about this uh, over the i imagine so <laughs> um and he's right, he is absolutely right, that uh, how you implement this policy is going to be crucial. But it's not a reason for not doing the policy as a whole. It's about the strategy and the tactics. The strategy is it's absolutely right that this unleashes the, our economies to um, raise the price of carbon, which is a good thing. Um, but the tactics is, do you apply this uh, globally or do you have um, uh, rebates for developing countries? Uh, and the answer is you probably do. The other thing is that this is of, this is a um, it's cash neutral because what you're doing is you're applying you're applying an adjustment. The treasury then receives that cash. What they do with that cash is entirely up to them. It can be redistributive. It can you know, or they could keep their sticky fingers on it and pay back pay down our, our our huge national debts. But it does give the treasury the opportunity to to reimburse. Uh, countries where you, that you wish to reimburse so you know, in, in summary barry is absolutely right it's something we need to take very seriously is how this doesn't uh, adversely impact the global south who have the least responsibility for the problem that we're trying um but it's not an ex it's not an argument for not doing the policy at all that's really helpful, Jerome. Thank you so much. I've got a question from Rachel Copskooner. Rachel, I know, who's a, one of our members, actually, as the uh, climate change lead um, in uh, Cotswold District Council in Gloucestershire. Rachel asks Hannah, could you elaborate on why a carbon tax might be better for smaller businesses than, in, than an emissions trading scheme? Would it not be regressive in terms of disadvantaging SMEs versus bigger companies? And there's bit of, been a bit of conversation in the chat about, is this all a bit sort of corporate level you know how does this translate to your you know your your smaller businesses who are, will be struggling with the kind of complexity that we're talking about Hannah yeah I think it's a really good question and comes down to that word complexity one of our concerns is how how much resource is required to engage with an ETS and therefore whether a simpler price trajectory might be easier to respond to amongst those who are used to paying taxes, for example, um, and that there's a lot of good questions around this topic on the need for effective governance, which I think was, was talked about a bit earlier. So if we are going to have a simple carbon price that rises over time, how can we make sure that uh, sticks rather than is frozen and, and the things that we can do there to provide reassurance that any investments, particularly for those smaller businesses that might have less money to invest, um, have sort of pay, pay off over the longer term. Um, so yeah, that, that's essentially, and, that, and that's come from, I should have mentioned, we 
Uh, Rianne Marie was one of our brilliant commissioners, but we had a commission who looked into this very deeply and spoke to a lot of experts across a lot of different sectors uh, on this topic. So part of that finding has come out of that. Um, it, it's not just an assumption that we've made. Now, I've got a question. I don't really know who's going to be best placed to answer it, but I've got a question from Harriet Hannibal. Does um, ha the Treasury worry that UK companies buying cheap allowances available offshore will result in income leaving the UK through um, an e emissions trading scheme? Low prices are highly likely as new ETS schemes will be very generous in the initial phases. I mean, we know that from the EU ETS. I know when I was working on this, the price of carbon was not really reflective of the, as uh, Rianne Marie would describe it, as the externalities uh, at all. So um, I don't know, Rianne Marie, what do you think about that? Do you know, I'm, I might come back to that one in a sec, because I'm going to pass it on that one. There's some other comments in the chat that I thought I'd, I, I did really want to comment on, which was about um, passing the costs on to consumers, if I may. Um, yeah, sure. Because yes, the conversation to date has all been about, you know, international trade flows and corporates and things like that. But um, the work that Hannah referred to earlier from the Zero Carbon campaign um, did look at, uh, you know, the different sectoral charges that could be brought in by sector and concluded and that up to 27 billion uh, could be uh, per year of additional carbon charges additional revenues to the treasury could be generated by 2030. And that was based on getting to a 75 pounds per carbon tonne of carbon dioxide equivalent charge over that period. And what was very clear, so from my perspective, again, talking about how does that spur further investment, I was very focused on making sure that that should be used to support innovation and investment in clean energy alternatives especially around carbon capture technologies, electrification, hydrogen. Um, I'd also really want to see, I'm obviously going to die on this hill of continuing to ask for government monies to be used to crowd in private finance in the form of guarantees and first loss mechanisms. But more importantly, or equally importantly, is this finance could be used to cushion rises in household bills, most immediately on gas, but also on food and goods and transport. Um, one potential idea could be to pay for a dividend per household. Um, that was certainly a comment that came up in the chat. Or, you know, funding the removal of renewable support costs away from consumer electricity bills into general taxation, which I think is another of the comments in the chat. So having said all of that, I've completely forgotten the question from Harriet. I'm very sorry, Polly. Maybe I'm not best to answer that one anyway. But OK, well, I think I think Jerome, uh, Jerome's ready to answer. And then I've got a question from uh, Hilary Ben when I can when I can bring him in. But Jerome, can you answer that question? OK, I'm also not going to answer the question. Because, <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> I think, I think politicians Jerome, on turbo charge but, today. But, but I do want to I really do want to carry on about this uh, this cost to the consumer, because in one sense, that's the whole point. You know, we need to pass the cost onto the consumer so that we change consumer behavior. So um, that is what we're trying to achieve. It sounds rather mean to say it, but it's the truth. But then you, you, that, butts into the politics question. <laughs> that butts into the politics of it, which is that um, it becomes very unpopular, particularly if there's no low carbon alternative that um, people can choose to move on to because it hits the poor uh, disproportionately. So you use the cash, which um, the Grantham Institute in their report uh, suggested that a border carbon adjustment and uh, the resulting increased uh, carbon cost taxation could provide, which is in the tens of billions of pounds, you can use that in the first instance to cushion the impact, particularly on um, the lower income sectors, until such time as lower carbon alternatives have been you know, have been incentivized by the market to come out and, and uh, be available. And then the, the taxation or the, the or the benefits can can start reversing out. So that's OK, that's great. Jerome, I'm going to bring um, Hilary Ben in. Harriet, we haven't forgotten your question. I'm going to try to get somebody to answer it at some point, but I do want to bring in Hilary at this moment. Yeah, Hilary. Polly, hi. Hello. Very, very nice to see you. Um, I do, um, now, my question really is in two parts. It's about border carbon adjustments. The first is a, a practical one. If, you, if you're going to apply it to steel, what does that do to the price of steel in the UK, just to sort of illustrate it? And secondly, what proportion of the products that everybody talks about, fertilizers, steel, cement, aluminum, and petrochemicals, for instance, what percentage of, if you like, externalized UK CO2 emissions do those products account for? 
and the reason for asking it is the second part of the question is this, as you'll be well aware, there are quite a few people who say, aha, you claim emissions have fallen uh, by 40% in the UK since about 1990, but they haven't really, because all you've done is get all your manufactured goods made in China and Vietnam and elsewhere, and you're importing their high CO2 emissions in making the product. Um, uh, the first point I would make is I think it's really hard to count the way in which other countries choose to produce uh, energy to make products against your domestic total. Secondly, I don't understand how you would do it. But it does beg the question for those who are arguing that they should be taken into account, whether if border carbon adjustments move on to other products, I don't know how much CO2 is involved in making an iPhone in China, um, and that affects the price, then how do you avoid ending up with people with high incomes still being able to buy um, iPhones in the UK because they can afford to pay the BCA extra, whereas upon many of my constituents on low incomes couldn't buy them any more. And how do we make sure that it works in a fair way for citizens of the country? Thank you. Great. That's really helpful, Hilary. I will ask Jerome to answer that, but then I'm going to come back to Hannah to answer Harriet's question, I think. And then I've got a couple of other questions that are linked to what should be included uh, in terms of agriculture and so forth. But Jerome, just do your response to Hilary's point there. Okay, so I hope I've got all three of those questions, uh, Hilary. But the first one is on steel. What happens to the price of steel? It goes up because we're we're bringing in an externality that is currently um, out there and not being paid for. But that's what the that's what the market needs because that cost is being incurred, but it's being paid for by society rather than by the purchaser. So that's the rationale for it. But if you if you look what happens to the steel industry in the United Kingdom, if we uh, implement this policy. There's been work done by Frontier Economics, uh, a report specifically on the steel industry, which shows that it actually becomes increasingly competitive, both in, that, uh, in its domestic market and also internationally. So it should lead to a renaissance of our steel industry and other uh, producers, because we're no longer offshoring. It's removing a, a reason to offshore that uh, carbon emission, and you can reshore it. Have the have both the emissions, which is important. We we own up to our own emissions uh, domestically, but we also have the employment domestically as well. Uh, as to the percentage of costs, I, I think the question was uh, the percentage of costs um, that the carbon uh, would make up for the six or so. Or so uh, biggest emitters that we often talk about. Um, I don't have that information uh, to hand, uh, but you're you're absolutely right. We start off with, uh, it's likely that the government, if they adopt this, would start off with the five or six biggest emitters, which would be cement, yeah. aluminium, steel. And then as we understand the process better, we then grow it out to wider sections of the economy. But it might mirror, for example, the, 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 uh, the ETS, yeah, ETS is, is heavy industry, and we were told earlier on that's about 30% of our, of our emissions. Um, so I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if it mirrored that. And finally, how do you do it um, when internationally, how, you know, it is difficult to assess um, the carbon input uh, of, a, of an import. I think the starting point would be to look at the energy production mix in that country. So, for example, we've, we've already mentioned China. Uh, you look at China and between 70 and 80 percent of its electricity is from coal. And that would be the basis. That would be your starting point for an assessment. Um, and then as we got better at this, uh, individual companies, if they could demonstrate that they had a lower a lower uh, carbon footprint than the norm, then you could have a certification process. But that would that would be my starting point. Uh, Thanks very so much. It, it does, thank you. It does somewhat feel that it might be there might be a bit of a spike in the price of iPhones for a bit while the while the market adjusted, which is not an in, it's not an insignificant issue because they're basically almost a utility these days for everybody. They're the way we're t we're test and tracing. They're the way we're accessing our um, so much information and and uh, and so forth. So we mustn't underestimate what uh, the, the kind of impacts might be. Harriet on the EU, on the ETS aspect, oh, sorry, not Harriet, Hannah on, on uh, Harriet's point about the ETS and how it might affect um, low income, uh, not the smaller businesses, for example. Yeah, sure. So uh, I, I am getting to Harriet's question, but just one extra reflection to add to what oh, no, Rowan just said. Don't worry, I will get there. Um, is that one of the other benefits um, of border adjustments is that they do encourage others to implement their own carbon pricing systems rather than to pay into another country's one. And in that we can 
there, there's a lot that we can do to support that development from a UK perspective. So we are already involved in a programme called the Partnership for Market Implementation, whereby we export our expertise on carbon pricing to other jurisdictions and help them get it right, which will obviously in turn then help them get to grips with their emissions and lower the cost of production abroad too. So that there's a lot outside of just the domestic stuff. Um, Harriet's question was on uh, worrying that UK companies might buy cheaper permits from abroad. Um, I think so to the point that Darren made earlier, it's quite complicated to link emissions trading systems because you have to get a certain amount of equivalence that means that they can work together. Um, and where we're seeing other even sort of progress in the EU with regards to the stringency of their ETS um, and, and the UK potentially having to raise our bar before we're allowed a link, I think there's quite a lot that controls for uh, that instance to ensure proper alignment in terms of um, not only floor prices, but um, the, the volume of uh, emissions that are across, sorry, the, the amount of your market that is involved in the trading system too. So it's certainly something to worry about, but I think there's quite a lot of governance around it. That is, however, a very important to raise with regards to negative emissions and carbon offsetting, where we need a lot better standardization to, with regards to that point about credits, such that you can't just offset your emissions with very cheap credits abroad, when actually um, that it might not necessarily have a positive environmental impact. So we would say that we certainly need to think about negative emissions pricing too, and the stringency around how that is done and whether there's scope to, to have a more kind of less voluntary and more formal system of offsetting that fits alongside this as well to respond to that concern. I'm going to ask some of the questions that have been posted in the Q&A, but I want everybody to think now on the panel, what do you want parliamentarians to do to be able to take this forward? Because the reality is we can all get a work out what the perfect answer is in this conversation. I don't think we will get there in the next few minutes, but we, we can try. The, the reality is this ends up, up hard up against how much people can afford, whether they've got a job and whether they can get, be able to keep a roof over their head and whether they think uh, their, their children will have a, um, a better uh, life and prospect. And all of those things are threatened by things like... Uh, Darren pointed out putting the um, price of gas up um, more expensive iPhones like Hillary pointed out all those kind of things what is the what how does parliament and elected MPs who have to account for their decisions to their electorate what should they be doing to be able to create the conditions where we can start acknowledging within our economy the price of carbon in some way? I want you to think about that while I go to a couple of questions. I've got one particularly for Rianne Marie. Josie Murdoch is asking, given your work on the TNFD, do you th um, whether um, pr whether there is any, well, do you think that natural capital may be included in carbon pricing in the future through the ETS with natural capital credits? Uh, so thank you, Josie, for that question. For anyone who's not familiar with TNFD, that is the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosures. So obviously building on the work of the TCFD, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, and providing a, a framework for companies and financial services to disclose how nature impacts their business and also how their business impacts nature. Um, and so I would... The, the short answer to your question, Josie, is yes, I think this conversation has focused very much on uh, technological solutions and innovation, but I think increasingly we are recognizing the need to also capture nature-based solutions when we're thinking about uh, solutions for the for climate change as well as uh, you know nature loss and biodiversity. So yes, I think we do need to think beyond the traditional sectors and look at how we might look at natural capital credits. And that then does, uh, there's another question in the chat, Polly, about the inclusion of agriculture. Yeah, I was going to follow up with that one. Yeah, because it seems, you know, that's two sides of the same coin in a way. Um, and I was just going to say on agro, carbon pricing functions really well in sectors like electricity, where you've got large fixed point sources where alternative technologies are available to one of the points Jerome made earlier, and polluters can't easily relocate. But it's really more difficult to implement in things like agriculture and food, where you know the, those systems, when you think about them beyond our borders, they're characterized by lots of different types of commodities, dispersed production, millions of farmers, and in really different contexts. So not just local communities and climate, but even things like soil conditions as well as really deeply entrenched cultural conventions and tastes and dietary habits, 
all of it make it really difficult to assess the level of an effective carbon price and implement that efficiently throughout the system. That's not to say that it shouldn't be high on the list, it's just one of the more complicated sectors to start. That said, in the UK, we've obviously got the opportunity coming out of CAP and with our focus on ELMS uh, to start looking at a more holistic way of how we're pricing for um, land use and how we can try and going back to the redistributive point earlier, make sure that uh, any carbon tax is distributed in such a way that it will incentivize the right sort of uh, climate behavior from landowners and the agriculture, agriculture sector and farmers. So I'll, I'll leave that, that. That's really helpful. I've got a question from Oliver Thomas. I'd like, I'd like really this to be, if you can answer this and then do that sum up on what you want parliamentarians to do next, right? Is carbon pricing currently linked directly to the calculated damage costs of climate impacts? Um, and if you can do that answer, and what do you want parliamentarians to do? I think we'll, we'll hit the 3.30 deadline. Hannah, do you want to go first and then Jerome and then Ria Marie? Yes, sure. So there's a bit of a debate between what is called the social cost of carbon and then the carbon price required to achieve a certain level of emissions reductions. Currently, I would say that in, in the UK, possibly linked to neither, but we're more focused on finding the right price that can drive the right emissions reductions rather than factoring what is called the social cost of carbon. Um, and then on uh, action and parliamentarians, I'd, I'd just say first and foremost, don't be afraid to engage with this topic. I completely understand why it is viewed as has been previously in the past, viewed as being contentious. But, you know, we see a public mandate building for option the mo for action. The most helpful thing we can do is is work together to try and find a way through and to develop that roadmap for phasing in carbon pricing reform over the longer term to help get to a point at which we have priced in these externalities. So yeah, don't be don't be afraid to engage. Jerome, I know you're not afraid to engage. You've really been able to uh, set the the uh, the political weather in a little bit on this um, amongst the, those people who are already engaging. How do you think we need to spread that spread the uh, the understanding at least? Okay, so I've got three points: advocacy, education, and support. So first of all, advocacy. This I think there's been a real mistake to think of uh, climate change and our response to it as being a left wing or a sort of a liberal agenda. It's not. This is a right wing agenda as well as a left wing. In fact, it's not. It's neither wing. It's all of us agenda. And one of the key things of, since entering Parliament just over a year ago is to is to try and make this a right wing you know, comfort zone because it should be. Um, and so I think advocacy amongst our electorate about the rationale for a re uh, reducing our carbon uh, uh, output and uh, and explaining why it's so important. Then it's education is both actually you know, education in the school curriculum, I think is really important as we as we grow through uh, our demographics, but also it's just, you know, what's the alternative? You know, where, where, where do we want to go? What's the alternative without being sort of catastrophic about it, although unless we need to be, but it's to, you know, it's fine. The, the people who get this, um, they all, they don't need persuading. It's lots of slightly older, maybe slightly more right, you know, right of center leaning people people who vote for me, uh, we need to bring these people along on this journey. And that means speaking in language which, which they doesn't instinctively get their backs up um, and to be persuasive. So I think that's really important. And then support, because we've got a real opportunity right now uh, to encourage the government along the line that it wants to go anyway, which is in the G7, to get uh, border carbon adjustments at least on the table. So I, my definition of success is not that we're going to have, you know, let's all sign on the dotted line in, you know, in June. It's let's have this as a recognised, articulated joint goal. And then maybe next year or two years down the line, it, it gets further. So that's what we need. We need advocacy, education, ad, uh, education and then support for the G7 process. Lovely. Ria Marie, your final thoughts, please. Well, I just wanted to reiterate the points Jerome made there, and especially about, you know, the opportunity for green job creation and the road back to prosperity following coronavirus being very much focused on the green agenda. Um, and I'm, I'm loving that this is a no wing agenda phrase. I think we might copy that one. Um, but also, um, I think Hannah 
hasn't taken the opportunity because she's being far too modest to talk about the fantastic work that she's been leading around the zero carbon campaign, which actually provides a report that, um, as she mentioned, a number of, of us as commissioners uh, contributed to over the last year, which calls on government to, to set a clear carbon price trajectory, reaching a minimum of 75 pounds per tonne of carbon dioxide equivalent by 2030 that is charged upstream on the producers of greenhouse gases. Um, that, that 75 number is the number that national and international studies have found is the necessary price to reach net zero emissions by 2050, which is obviously the legislated target. Um, it does go by sector. Um, there are obviously certain sectors, for example, surface transport, where the price is already implicitly higher than this level through fuel duty. Um, and looking at areas like aviation, where we should be um, commandeering things like the air, air passenger duty should be slowly converted into a carbon charge. So it goes into every sector, explaining the different pathways to getting to that 75 pounds. And it, it comes with a very clear set of recommendations for policymakers. Um, it'd be great, Polly, if we could put that link into the chat box. Um, and uh, I'm sorry for embarrassing you, Hannah, but it is a fantastic piece of work. And I think it's uh, it's worthy of a call out. It's absolutely Thanks, what's Mary. needed since, since that piece of work has inspired this meeting uh, in the first place. And we want to be able to make sure that people do understand all of those uh, aspects of it. I think what's really interesting is that, like I say, people start off with, well, what we need is a price on carbon. And before you know it, you realise that this needs to be done by sector, done by geography, done by uh, uh, thinking about issues to do with fairness. And whatever you think about the language, making sure that it's not just, I mean, Jerome says it's more people who vote for you. It's people who actually vote for everyone. Everyone, you know, people who are too busy to worry about the planet because they've got to get food on the, on the table and they're thinking about their job. A lot of those people work in energy intensive industries threats to their job by whacking a massive great big um, price on carbon needs to be thought of in a way that gives people a chance to be able to see that there is an alternative for them and that goes as much for jobs as it goes for fuel prices uh, in keeping your house warm. Um, so I think this has been a really, really exciting and dynamic conversation, bearing in mind quite how technical these things can be. Thank you so much for all the contributions, both in the Q&A and in the chat, and people who've been able to uh, come uh, to uh, voice their um, views like uh, Hilary. Thanks again. Um, I'm afraid Darren had to go. Um, uh, but we've had his contribution and he's been able to listen to a little bit of the further conversation. Ramari and Jerome, again, fantastic uh, for you to um, uh, contribute. And thank you, Hannah, for the report and to Zero C for uh, enabling us to be able to bring these thoughts to the uh, to the attention of parliamentarians. Um, thank you all and have a great rest of the day. Thanks, Polly.